nine-year-old boy wrote a letter to NASA. He wrote, Dear NASA, my name is Jack Davis, and I'd like to apply for the Planetary Protection Officer job. By the way, that is actually a real job at NASA. Jack writes, I may be nine, but I think I'd be a fit for the job. My sister says I'm an alien. Also, I've seen almost all the space and alien movies I can see. I've seen the show Marvel's Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and I hope to see the movie Men in Black. I'm great at video games. I'm young, so I can learn to think like an alien. Sincerely, Jack Davis, Guardian of the Galaxy. Well, NASA did write back to Jack, and they urged him to study hard and to do well in school, but they didn't give him the job. Doesn't surprise me that they didn't give him the job. You know what surprises me? What surprises me is the job that God has given to you and to me. Because God has actually given us a job that's more important than planetary protection officer. If you will, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, and we left off last time with the words of Jesus at the end of chapter 9. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What harvest is Jesus talking about? Well, Jesus said, the harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. That is the job that God has entrusted to you and to me. I want us this morning just to answer three questions about this, this very important job that you and I have. Question number one is this, who does God use to do his work? You know, it's interesting the people God uses to do his work. Chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. In order to understand what's going on here with Jesus choosing these 12 disciples, it's important for us to understand a little bit something about Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, the education system went like this. The first level of Jewish education was called Beth Sefer, Beth Sefer literally means house of the book. It was equivalent uh, to elementary education. Boys and girls from the ages of 5 to 12 would attend Beth Sefer, and they were taught to read and to write and to memorize the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, after they completed Beth Sefer, children concluded their formal education, then they went into a trade or they went into the family business. But if you were one of the top students, if you were one of the best of the best, you were allowed to go on to the next level of education, which was Beth Midrash. Beth Midrash means house of study, and it was the equivalent of secondary education. Boys from the ages of 13 to 15 studied the rest of the Old Testament. They also studied the oral law and traditions. Now, after Beth Midrash, then these, these boys that had completed this, then they would go into a trade or they would go into the family business unless they were the best of the best of the best. Only if you were the cream of the crop were you allowed to continue on and they would go to the, to the third and the highest level of education, which was to be a, a rabbi's disciple. In Hebrew, they were called a Talmud. Ray Vanderlane wrote, Talmud is the Hebrew word for disciple. The Talmud willingly left home, family, and occupation 
to be with the rabbi because he wanted more than anything else in the world to be like the rabbi in his walk with God. As the rabbi lived and taught his understanding of the scripture, his Talmud listened to him, watched him, followed him, memorized his words, and imitated his walk with God. Eventually, the Talmud became a teacher who had his own disciples who wanted to learn from him how to walk with God. Here's what I want you to see. Most rabbis only took as their disciples the best of the best of the best of the best. They took the most highly educated, most highly skilled, and then they would become their followers. Jesus does something radically different. Jesus chose very common, very ordinary people. By the way, occupation-wise, most of his followers were what? Fishermen. They had already gone into a trade. They had already not continued on with their higher education. They were the common working man, the common working class, and Jesus chose these men to be his disciples, his his disciples. Someone wrote this imaginary letter. To Jesus, son of Mary, Woodcrafter's Carpenter Shop in Nazareth, from the Jordan Management Consultants in Jerusalem. Dear sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you've picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests. We've not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. As part of our service, we make some general comments for your guidance. It's the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. We recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and ability and proven character. Simon Peter's emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it's our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He's highly motivated and ambitious and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot, as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Probably the most well-known to to us and to others in the New Testament of the 12 disciples were were Peter and John. They they were part of the inner circle that Jesus had. Do do you know what Acts chapter 4 says about them? Peter and John were unschooled, ordinary men. The challenge a lot of us have is we read the Bible and we think these guys are superheroes. We think these great men and women of the faith, we read their stories and we say, I could never do that. You read about Moses and you read about David and Daniel and all these people in the Bible and it seems like, man, they're superheroes. I'm just me, just ordinary me. I, I could never do any of that stuff. But you know what the truth is? Most of them are like us. They are just ordinary people that have placed themselves in the hands of an extraordinary God. They're they're human instruments that God has used in a tremendous way. And here's the thing. He'll do the same thing with you if you allow him to. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Question number two is, who, who does God send us to then? Verse 5, 
These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Jesus first sent out his disciples, it was a very narrow focus. Just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When we get to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we read this, though. Jesus says to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations. Everybody. You see what Jesus did is he started them with a narrow focus and he simply was saying to them, start right where you are. Start where you are and then you branch out. And the same thing's true for for you and for me. We just start where we are. God's planted you. He's planted you in your job, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your circle of friends. And what he says to you is the same thing he said to his disciples. Start right where you are. You know, sometimes we we miss the opportunities that are right in front of us. You know, one day if I went overseas, I would do... Well, Well, that's fine for one day. But right now, start right where you are. And you start where you are, and you serve where you are, and you love where you are, and you share where you are, and then you work your way outward. But God always calls us to start right where we are, and that's my encouragement to you. In your circle of friends and family and neighbors and and everybody that God has brought into your life, start there, and then work your way outward. Question number three is, how do we do God's work? And I'd like for us to spend the remainder of our time answering this important question. How do us ordinary people, doing the work right where we are right now, how do we actually do it? How do we actually get it accomplished? Well, if you look back at verse 1, it says, When he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. Where, Where do you get the power to do God's work? comes from God, right? It takes God's power to do God's work. Some of us would say, why don't I have God's power in my life the way I want to have it, the way I need to have it? And Jesus actually answers that question in John chapter 15. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But now he tells them what they need to do to have this power in their lives. If you abide in me, let's spend time with Christ, and my words abide in you, you let God's word take up residence in your life and control your life, you will ask, that's prayer, isn't it? You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. If you want God's power in your life, you need to spend time with him, spend time in his word, and then let his word take up residence in your life, and then pray. That's simply what Jesus is saying to us. John R. Stott is a um, preacher, and on one occasion he was invited to to give a message at the University of Sydney in Australia. He gave a series of messages, and the last night was supposed to be the capstone. Everything was working up to the last night. They had invited, they, they, they had the, the, the big university stage, they had invited a lot of people, and this is what Stott wrote. He, he said that shortly, shortly before the last evening, he lost his voice. And he wrote, what can you do with a missionary who has no voice? We'd come to the last night of the evangelistic campaign, the students had booked the big university hall. A group of students gathered around me and I asked them to pray that the thorn in the flesh might be taken from me. We also prayed that if it pleased God to keep me in weakness, I'd rejoice in my infirmities in order that the power of Christ might rest upon me. As it turned out, I had to get in within one inch of the microphone just to croak the gospel. I was unable to use any inflection of voice to express my personality. It was just a croak in a monotone. And all the time we were crying to God that his power would be demonstrated in human weakness. Well, I can honestly say that there was a far greater response that night than any other night. I've been back to Australia 10 times now, and on every occasion, 
Somebody has come up to me and said, do you remember that night you lost your voice? I was converted that night. Second thing we want to notice is it takes teamwork to do God's work. If you notice here in verses 2 through 4, all of them are paired up. It'll say Peter and Andrew, James and John, uh, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew. And when you go to all the other gospel accounts, it's the same way, and it's always the same two pairs. Why is it that way? Mark chapter 6 says, He called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two. Why two by two? If you send them out one by one, they cover twice as much ground, right? So why does Jesus send them out two by two? Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says two are better than one. Well, why are two better than one? Because they have a good return for their work, and if one falls down, his friend can help him back up. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. There are certain things that can't be done by an individual. They have to be done by a team. Can you imagine... You know, and I'm so thankful for the church we have here. We have so many people that get involved and they serve and they minister. You know, in some churches, they, they kind of take the attitude, well, we pay the pastor. So, you know, he really ought to. Can you imagine us doing Bethlehem experience and everybody takes the attitude, well, you know, we pay the pastor to do it. So I'm the donkey and Mary <laughs> and the archangel and the sheep and I'm Jesus and I'm sleeping the sleeping disciple. By the way, I've always wanted to be one of the sleeping disciples. <laughs> and they won't let me do it because I snore too much. Just drowns there. But, but you get the idea. You can't have an individual do that. You need a team. And, and it's really the same thing for anything in God's work. Even when it looks like it's an individual, it's not an individual. It's a team. A team of people being involved behind the scenes and especially a team of people that are, that are praying. We're in the process of hiring a director of children's ministries, but I hope we understand we don't hire somebody and say, okay, well, now they're going to go out and they're going to... No, they're going to be part of the team, right? And we're all going to be the team, aren't we? Because we want to win our community for Christ. We want to bring in young people and train them and teach them and lead them to Christ and disciple them. And as their families come in, we want to share Christ with them and equip them. But that's not the work of one person, is it? That's everybody. Everybody using their particular gift. Everybody getting involved. Everybody praying. Those that can teach, teach. Those that can do other things, they do those other things. That's always the way it is with God's work. God's way is this. No one does everything, but everyone does something. It's the way God always does it. Peter wrote this. Each of you. Don't run past that. Each of you. What's that mean? Everyone. Each. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. Every one of you, everyone here has a spiritual gift. And God says, each of you should use it. Two are better than one, and there's a second reason. Ecclesiastes says if one falls down, his friend can help him back up. I picture these guys going from town to town to town. And it was a challenging ministry. And I picture sometimes that Peter was just down. And he was ready to give up. And he felt so discouraged. And Andrew would pick him up. And then there were other times when, when, when Andrew was having a rough go of it. And Peter picked him up. And by the way, that's what God wants us to do as a family. We're always looking for somebody to, to, to help, somebody to pick up, somebody who's stumbled, and how we can help them. There's a third thing. It takes clarity to do God's work. Look at verse 7. 
And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, that's a pretty clear message, isn't it? That's just straight and to the point. You know, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I, I wrote a message on a piece of poster board. Can, can you read the? Oh, I've got it upside down. There you go. That's better. Can, can you read this? Anybody read the message? You can't read I've got to work on my penmanship, I guess. You know, when I first wrote this message, it was really very clear, though. I, I, I wrote Christ. But then I started to add some things to the message. Then I wrote Baptist, and I wrote Methodist, and I wrote Charismatic, and I wrote Presbyterian, and I wrote traditional music and contemporary music. You know, and then I wrote suit and tie, and then I wrote politics, and I just, I, I just added a whole lot to the message, and now, now you can't even read it, can you? Do we do that with the message of Christ? We, we do. We add so much to the message that people on the outside are confused. They don't even understand what the message is. If you ask somebody, what's the message of Christianity, they would come up with a dozen different things. Well, it's about this, and it's about that, and I think that, you know, because we, we've added so much to the message that it's become confusing where the message Jesus gave them was very clear and very to the point. Now, Satan isn't stupid. He knows the best way to make the message ineffective is to make sure no one knows what the message is. Do you remember what Paul said? He said, we preach Christ crucified. That was the message. When you ask people what Paul's message is, they said, Christ crucified. They got it. It was clear. It was to the point. He didn't add layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of other stuff so that no one knew what the message was. And it's the same for us. We've got to be very clear about our message. I, I, I'll just give you one example. It's why I don't talk about politics up here, because I don't want people to think that's the message. I've got my opinions. I've got ways I think about it. But you know what the message is? Christ crucified. That's the message. And when we add layer upon layer upon layer of what I like and you like and this person wants, it becomes too confusing. It's no longer clear. There's a fourth thing. It takes compassion to do God's work. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Now on the one hand, they were sent to everyone, but then Jesus specifically sends them to the hurting, to the brokenhearted. Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Listen, God loves us all. There's a special place in God's heart for those that are hurting. Psalm 147, the Lord heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. John MacArthur said, one who truly represents Jesus Christ gives himself to the poor, the hurting, the needy, and the downtrodden. When I see people who claim to represent Jesus Christ and yet are devoted to the rich and famous, I wonder about that. The rich and famous need Christ too, but it's characteristic of God's representatives that they're drawn to the hurting, the downcast, the sick, the poor, and the needy. There's a fifth thing. It, it, it takes faith to do God's work. As he sends them out, he gives them this instruction in verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Why did Jesus tell them 
not to take all these supplies with them. Apparently, they had the supplies because Jesus says, don't take them. Why does he send them out without everything that it seems like they're going to need? At the end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus refers back to this moment. Jesus asked them, when I sent you out without money bag, knapsack, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. I imagine them just thinking back on those times of ministry and just saying, everywhere we went. And we couldn't possibly imagine, you know, when that need came up and we had nothing to fall back on, God provided it. Sometimes miraculously, sometimes just through his people, but he always came through. It took faith. They didn't say, you know what, God, we will go out and we'll do this ministry, but you need to show us ahead of time that you've provided everything that we absolutely need. You know what they did? They just said, you send us, we'll go. And we'll trust that wherever we go, you will provide for us what we need when we need it. In the Old Testament, there's a time when the children of Israel, they come to the Jordan River, and they're supposed to cross over. And there they are at the Jordan River. How do we get to the other side? And Jesus tells them, he says, well, step into the river. Here's what it says in Joshua chapter 3. As soon as the feet of the priest who are carrying the ark touch the water at the river's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing, and the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over. It wasn't until they stepped out in faith that all of a sudden the river dried up. And it's really the same way with you and with me. There are so many times that God asks you to step out in faith in something in your life, something that you're hesitant to do, something that you say, I don't know about this. But when you know God's leading, you know what you have to do? You take that step of faith. And then you see him provide for you right at that moment of need. By the way, as a church, the same thing's true for us. You know, God tells us to take steps of faith. We always, you know, we always well, you know, if, if we have this, 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 and this all in place ahead of time, sometimes it's, just, it's more just listening for God's voice and God's Spirit's leading. And then when God says to take that step, you take the step. And it's when your feet touch the water, if you will, that then it's provided for. It takes faith. Finally, number six, and we'll end with this. It takes strength to do God's work. The disciples were going to go from town to town to town to town. In some places, they would meet people that would love them. In other places, they would meet people that, that hated them. You know, it's St. Patrick's Day, and so I thought I would share with you the words of a, an old Irish prayer. May those that love us, love us. And those that don't love us, May God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so we'll know them by their limping. Well, that's not exactly the, the biblical way to approach it. Let, let, let's see what the real approach ought to be. Verse 11. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city." What's the deal about shaking the dust off of your feet? You know, when I read this initially, the first couple of times, I thought of it kind of, you, you ever get the kind of just brushing somebody off? But then I came to realize that's really not what it's talking about. It's not this, well, I'm better than you type attitude. 
Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony to them. The point is, Jesus isn't saying, well, this just proves you're better than them. You know what he's saying? Do this as a message, as a warning to them. The testimony or the warning is this. If you brush God aside, if you brush his message aside, one day you'll be brushed aside also. It wasn't a warning of superiority. It was a warning of concern. As they were leaving the town, the town that rejected them, it was one last chance to say to these people, you're in danger. You're brushing aside God's gift. You're brushing aside God's son. And one day, you'll be brushed aside also if you don't change. It was one last message of a warning and of a hope that it wasn't too late yet, but one day it would be. Let me close with these verses on how to handle opposition because we all will have to handle opposition. How do we do it? Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, patient with difficult people. He must gently instruct those who oppose the truth in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth.